there is um, no one, there's nothing that nobody goes through that somebody else hasn't had that same, same thing uh, happening. So um, I just want to kind of share what's going on in my journey. And also, we're going to look at the word together and just kind of focus on what the word of God says, because ultimately it is our direction. It is how we, how we function in life because of the word. And so I just want to give you a little bit about what's going on in my life. So, you know, like when changes go on, changes going on in, in, on your job, you know, uh, you are so secure in one little area of your job and, and you um, are used to something being a certain way and then things get stirred up and it's not that way or not the vision that you had pictured it, it was going to be, um, you know, when you're when you been over a certain way for so long, and then all of a sudden, things are shaken up. Things are different. And it's not like what you think it should be. So, um, so it kind of takes you to a place of like, okay, God, I'm trusting you in this what's going on here. And so my mind got to thinking about um, in trusting him, um, I don't want to say the unknown because he reveals to us everything, you know, but sometimes all the details of the plan, you just have to trust him in it, you know, and so um, I've been walking that out practically. What do you do? What do you do? Because the first thing that happens when things start stirring and shaking, no matter where it is, the first thing that tries to come in on you is fear, and you know, we all know where that come from. It's not from God at all. It's fear, and so you have to attack that thing from the very beginning. So I'm just going to give you practical on, on me. I just started saying, okay, Lord, um, I'm going to trust you in this. I know that you put me here for a reason. And wherever you've got me going, I trust that every provision is made. Because he said, if you're walking in his path, every provision is made. So what is my goal here? To bring light into the world, to bring love wherever I am, to be a, make a difference in the kingdom of God for good wherever I am. So on the job, that doesn't change who I am because things are shaking, shaking up and all around. It doesn't change who I am. And so you, you have to mentally put your mind right there that you got to trust God. And... Also, you know, it just kind of, it just kind of, kind of um, puts you in a place. You have to surround yourself with people that know the word of God. You have to surround yourself with people that has a foundation in them, you know. And so men say it. We just kind of been going through some journeys together, hadn't we said it? Okay. And so we just kind of been sharing the word back and forth. And it's the word that gets you strong. And that's the reason the Bible said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together with other believers. It's not that you're coming in the, in the wall. It's really, you, you need that encouragement. You need somebody to help keep the word focused, keep you focused on the word. And so we're doing that. So not only, you know, as that was shaken up, you know, but it's some other things like with, with your children. Some things are different and things are like, seem like it's shaking, it's changing. Not bad, but just different. So what do you do? You know the end result. But it's this, this part in here. You know, you know the end result. Your, 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 your children will live and declare the work of the Lord. You know, that they will uh, be smarter than, ten times smarter than all the wise people around. You know all the end result. But this here. And it has to do with getting rid of the fear and trusting God for his direction for your life. Because listen, if you, if you look back on the things, he's never let you down. He's never done you wrong. And so even with, with life, with your children, and then even here in the church, you know, and I'm just being transparent, okay? So, um, you know, the church is growing. It is growing, and I'm so thankful because, see, that's what we, that's what I've been praying for, for a long time. And I'm telling you, I had a vision a long time ago before all this started happening that cars were coming in and lining up, just line of cars coming off the freeway. I could see them coming off the freeway, coming to this church. So I knew this vision for a long time ago. 
And then you see so many different people coming in for such a time as this. And so um, I'm excited about it. But how many of you know that in growing that little security place you thought you had or that, that um, I don't want to call it a place because all of us have something to offer to the body, but that little security place that, you, that you've been in, it's widened now. You see what I'm saying? So, so in this journey, you have to get rid of the fear because, see, God, ooh, you know, doors are closing and other doors are opening. And you have to trust God and his leading and his direction in your life. And so I'm just going to share a few verses that, um, that you know, that I was kind of sharing with said today. Um, yeah, I'm just telling y'all, this guy right here, he's so good. Let me tell you, he's so, he's so encouraging, and he does it through music. I, look, say, I know you don't like, he don't like me doing this, but I'm just going to tell y'all, he does it through music. So um, today he came and and we were just singing, and the music was just going, and it changes things. He was reading a verse out of the Bible, and I'm just reading out, I mean, just listening to him, just reading a verse out of the Bible. Then he put it with music, and it just did, boom, it just, it just did something, you know, inside it. That verse even became more alive. And then we got to talking about how the kings in the Old Testament would have music people to calm him down, like Saul, you know, he went crazy. But, you know, the music kind of calmed him down. So, you know, the music calmed him down, and so music does a lot. So we just he's just kind of teaching me how to, how to do those things. But anyway, let me get to this scripture right quick, because I'm not going to be but a minute, because John got a message to give. So let's say um, in Isaiah, now I'm, I'm probably going to be reading out of the passion, so don't worry about trying to put it, and well, you can put it on the screen if you want to. Um, Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41, and it's going to be, uh, and let me see, verse 10. Come on now, what's wrong with this? Uh, what y'all blinging the lights for? Okay. <laughs> Let me see. Something going on, Isaiah 41. Who got that Bible? Let me see your Bible. You found it? You got it yet? Is there something going on? Let me see this Bible right. Oh, you got it. Okay. Wait. Oh, look. Time it came on. See? I believe these things be listening. But, um, okay. On Isaiah 41, and it's in the voice that I'm going to be reading out of, verse 10. Listen to this. It says... So don't be, for, don't be afraid. I am here with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, help you. I am here with my right hand to make right and to hold you up. See, he's always there to make right and to hold you up. And see, that's our comfort. That's, I'm telling you, this is what we need to do to encourage yourself. Get in the Word, find what, the, what God said, because, see, you're going to hear, you're going to be listening to one or two voices. You're going to listen to the enemy, or you're going to listen to God. And so you get yourself in the Scripture. It says to, that you will, I will strengthen you, help you. I'm here with my right hand to make right and hold you up. Now, no matter what it looks like, this is what God says. And what are we going to do? We're going to listen to what God says, right? And it says, and, and, and another thing that I, I saw, you know, we're, we're so set on destinations that we lose ourselves on the destination rather than in the process of getting there. You know what I'm saying? Like you making a, I ain't going to tell you what you did, but anyway, like you making a cake, you know what the cake looked like, but how you won't get there? It looked kind of messy sometimes, don't it? But it sure does taste good when you put it all together and you do it like it's supposed to, like the Word tells us to do it. It sure is going to be good. We just got to trust God for that. And listen to this. We're going to be in, all right, Psalms 23. And then I'm going to be finished. I'm just going to leave this with you. And hmm, I like this one out of the Passion. So let's go to Passion. Psalms 23. Y'all know this. This is real familiar right here. Oh, here it goes again, Sherry. Let me see. What, what 
the world? Okay. I know. Patience. Look, as soon as you said patience, this thing came flipping on like this. So, anyway, we, we must learn patience, right? Okay. Um, 23. All right. Here we go. Here, let me hold her thing. Okay. So, now we have Psalms 23. The Lord is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. He offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. His tracks take me to an oasis of peace, the quiet brook of bliss. That's where he restores and revives my life. He opens before me pathways to God's pleasure and leads me along in his footsteps to righteousness. Listen to this. In the little footnote thing, it says, or in talking about right, righteousness and the sheep being led in the path of righteousness, it says, or circular path of, paths of righteousness. It is a common trait for a sheep on the hillside of Israel to circle their way up higher. They eventually form a path that keeps leading them higher. This is what David is referring to here. Each step we take following our shepherd, our Lord, will lead us higher, even though it may seem like we're going in circles. Isn't that good? And that's so good. Even though it seems like you're going in circles, he's leading, you, he's leading you higher and higher so that I can bring honor to his name. Lord, even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me, for you have already done that. You remain close to me and lead me through it all the way. My authority, your authority is my strength and my peace. So I just want to encourage you that we all know the end result. It's like, you know, you want to look at the end of the book and see if they lived or died. We live. And if, in every situation, he gives life. It's just in that in-between time when you, when you, when you don't, not sure about how it's worked out, we have to trust God. We have to put our trust in him and don't waver. It says, have the faith without wavering because he's so faithful that promised. And also, he says, don't be worried about nothing. But in all prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, make your request known unto him. And see, the thing about that is, is that this is something that you have to choose. Make a decision that this is what I'm going to do, no matter what the situation looks like. And you can choose joy every time. And you can have joy. And people might look at you like you're crazy, like David was that time. But it's the joy of the Lord. And you can have peace about it. And that peace that surpasses all understanding, you know, when you finally put that fear in its place, when you put the plans of God in front of you, that's when you can walk it out and know and see the salvation of the Lord. Well, good evening. It's good to see everybody. Wish we were in a living room. I'm more comfortable there. It's been a long time since I've been in a pulpit. I had actually set up my life so that I would never do this again. Didn't want to do it again because of a lot of circumstances and things that were happening in my life. Kind of like what Wendy was talking about. Wendy, I want to share this with you because in my morning devotions, uh, as I was in Acts 12, and let me put my eyes on before I get to the message that God's laid on my heart for y'all. So in Acts 12 and 7, it says, Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Guard yourself. Tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. Wouldn't you think that if you're being freed from jail, you'd kind of have all that stuff in mind anyway? But he had to be told to do all this stuff. It's interesting. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Isn't it, a, isn't it amazing that Peter was in such a place of peace that he was sound asleep in his circumstance, which really was a jail? And who knows what all the other details were. I mean, when you're in jail, it's not pleasant. They don't treat you pleasantly. So who knows what else was going along with all that. But yet he was at a place of such peace that he was in such a sound sleep that the angel actually had to whack him 
to wake him up. And then he had to tell him what to do. <laughs> Gird yourself. Get your clothes on, boy. Let's get out of here. It, isn't that amazing? And I think that's that place of peace that Wendy's kind of alluding to, right? That, that peace that we have in Christ, not in our circumstance, but in Christ. Because we're in him, and he's in us. And that actually is a powerful mystery that we're going to talk about this evening. So, like I said, it's, it's been a long time since I've been in here, and these opportunities are rare. So I, it's a privilege for me to be up here exposing Christ, revealing Christ to you. It truly is. It's an honor. So this is a growth process for me, and I appreciate you all going through it with me. I'm going to be uh, reading mostly from my notes tonight because I wanted to make sure that I, I kind of stayed on task. Unlike Pastor, who's had so much experience, I'm not going to pretend to be eloquent in my speech. I'm not going to pretend to be elegant in how I present it. Uh, you're just getting me raw for the first time in a long time. And I'm excited to share Jesus with you. I'm going to entitle this, What Say You? I'm going to start in the scriptures, and I'm going to start in Mark 8. I'm going to read a lot of scripture tonight, because I think it's important to hear more of what God says than what I have to say. I'm going to try to tie it together with some thoughts, and, and my intention is to push you and to pull you and to stretch you. I like to live in the deep end of the pool. But when you're in the deep end of the pool, your footing is not sure. It's there, but it's not sure. But the foundation is there. And as I push you out, go ahead and wade with me, and let's see what the Holy Spirit is going to say to you, because he's really the one that's teaching you. Not my eloquence, not my elegance. It's the Holy Spirit that's inside of you that reveals to you the mind of Christ that's already in you. Paul said, I don't tell you these things because you don't know them. I tell them because you do. So these things that I'm going to share with you, I'm going to, I'm going to share them with you because you do know them. And in your spirit, it will bear witness to what I have to say. So we're going to start out in Mark 8, verses 27 through 29. And I'm going to mostly be in the New King James Version, because that's kind of where Pastor is most of the time. Now, to Jesus, now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter answers and says to him, you are the Christ. I want to look at that verse, and I want to look at it from a first-person perspective, and in two parts, part one being uh, focused on Christ's identity revealed to you and declared by you. Identity is a hot topic among Christians today and the world. We find it expressed in our songs, our conversations, our teachings, our praying. God's word has a lot to say about identity. God's identity, our identity, the identity of the church, not to say all the labels that the world has, to try to confuse you and, and, and corrupt your identity with races and all these other things. Countless ways that the world is trying to identify you in light of what God has simply said about you. I told you I'd be going from my notes. The Bible is a book on identity. If we were to do what booksellers commonly do when they're selling their books, they put a summary of what the book is about. And we might say simply would be a revelation of Jesus Christ to the world. Would a lot of you think that that's pretty much what the Bible is? And it is that. But if we just looked at that, we'd be missing the even greater truth, the even greater revelation that comes after that. And we're going to talk about that and what that is. I mean, that is the gospel, right? 
While most of us would agree that the Bible is the revelation of Christ, we would be overlooking this greater truth. And Paul knew this well. If you've spent any time reading through Paul's letters to the churches, you will discover for yourself what that greater truth is. The purpose for which Christ came and the purpose for which the Bible was written and given to us. And if you hazard a guess at what that greater truth might be, and it's okay if, you know, there are wrong answers. I'm not going to say there aren't any, but because obviously I have an agenda here, so there is a right answer. Say it again. God wants to live in us. Very close. That's very close. Eddie said God wants to live in us, and that's true. As us. Ding, ding, ding. You both get the prize. Thank you, Tim. Tim said as us. Yes, the greater truth, the most dynamic aspect of our redemption is the revealing, not of Christ just to us, but of Christ being revealed in us. And that's the second part of focusing on Christ's identity. Christ's identity revealed in us and declared by you. Let's look at Scripture to lay a foundation of Christ in the believer. In 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, and I don't intend for y'all to get all these up here because I'm going to kind of read through them quickly, but if I hesitate and pause on one, please put it up. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? As Eddie said. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 6 and 7. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts, in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure. We have this Christ, this Jesus in earthen vessels. Now you look at the end of that, that the power may be of God and not of us, and that could be a little confusing, but it's not really. I like how Mark takes things literally when you're reading them, and it helps to kind of do that in light of, you know, if you're going to interpret Scripture, you do it with other Scripture. You don't do it with the latest philosophies and what the latest gurus or preachers have come out with. Scripture is interpreted by Scripture. So that the power may be of God, but it's God with us, in us. And then it says, and not of us. And I have a note here that means uh, not of us apart from him. Because we're not apart from him anymore. You're going to see as we're going through these scriptures that we actually have a singular identity with Christ. A lot of people will think this is controversial. A lot of churches don't want to touch on this because they think there's kind of like some cliff of heresy that you're going to fall off into the great unknown. But we're just talking about what Scripture says, right? So in Galatians 1, 15 and 16, it says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Now, the things I circled in that verse was it pleased God to reveal his son in me. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, and most of you know this. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Little bonus on the end there. Faith of the Son of God. How many of you still think that you have a faith apart from Jesus's? Hmm. Do you? Galatians 4 and 19. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Some versions say fully formed in you. In Ephesians three fourteen through 20. For this reason, 
I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. That's right. Colossians 1 and 27. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. God's will to make known this mystery, which is Christ in you. 2 Thessalonians 1 and 10. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. And then most everybody knows this, right? This is a big identity verse. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You know, there were some things that passed away for Christ on the cross. He became new as well. He became something new in the resurrection, just like you did. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that. If we relate that to this verse in Philippians 3, 10, and 11, it says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Let me put a little selfless pitch in here for forever free, right? You all know I'm kind of in charge of kind of a lot of discipleship elements, Bible and Biscuits, small groups. We have a small group that pastor has received from the Lord, and, and many of you have been through it. And it goes through these very things in great detail. And we have seen such marvelous things happen in the people's lives that are attending the class. So sign up for it. It's on the 8th, and then the next Monday, because pastor's away, it will start. So it won't start the 9th. It'll be the 16th that that starts. Shameless plug for small groups, but hey, I'm the small groups guy. Romans 5, 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. You know, there is this notion among churches and among believers that we are somehow apart from Christ in this earth, even after we're born again that we are separated from him, that he's up there, that we're down here, that there is a us and then there's a him type of thing. And that's post-new birth. This thinking flies in the face of what the Bible's been telling us in the scriptures that I've read and the ones that I'm going to read. In 1 John 4, 17, which most of you know that one, and I'm going to read it in three different translations, so bear with me. And in the New King James, it'll say, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. You know, as I was thinking of that love part, I thought of 1 John 4, 8, too, where he goes on and he says, God is love. So if we were to take that and substitute that for love in the beginning, we would say God has been perfected among us. In this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. In the Amplified, it says, in this union and communion with him, love or God is brought to completion and attains perfection with us. Isn't that cool? With us. 
You know you're not alone? Do you know you're never alone? God's never alone either. Because we're always together in the new birth. That we may have confidence for the day of judgment with assurance and boldness. How many of you are so assured of that very truth that you are one with Christ, that you are united with Christ, that there is a boldness about you in your every day? I will tell you that a lot of the times I am, and there are some of the times that I'm not, just being transparent. Because as Wendy said, you know, there are certain circumstances will come into your life, and, and all of a sudden, my focus gets off of the Christ in me, and I start thinking of me without him, when there is no such thing. That me without him was put to death on the cross and was buried. He was put away, the me without him. You ever see Weekend at Bernie's? A lot of people don't really know much about that movie, and I've never actually seen the whole movie. But the idea of the movie, these, these two, two guys, these two young kids are at this, the guy's obviously very wealthy, so they're at his house, and there's parties that are going on in his house, and, and this guy up and dies, the guy that owns the house. But since the kids don't want to miss out on the parties, they start using him like a prop. They dress him up. They put him into different poses. They're sitting him on the couch. They're giving him drinks, and he's dead. And, of course, you know, nobody notices, right, because that's, that makes sense. <laughs> Hundreds of people in the house, in and out of the house, and nobody notices that this guy's actually dead. And then they made a sequel to it to carry it on further. How many of you have made a sequel carrying around that old man? A guy who doesn't exist anymore. And yet we still carry him around, having him walk with us, leg tied to one leg, giving him life, making him look like he's alive, and and we're actually believing that he might be, right? Because our eyes get focused off of the one who unites us and united us with him when he was resurrected. Hopefully that made sense. God with us. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, and that's in Isaiah. And then, of course, in the New Testament, is carried out in Matthew 1, and 23. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which translated means God with us. I'm going to go over, I'm going to call it two, uh, two accountings for oneness in the Bible. I'm going to call it, uh, after Christ, I'm going to call it the recreations accounting for oneness. And then pre-Christ, I'm just going to call it the creations accounting for oneness. So it's just the way my mind works. So sorry about that. <laughs> this is probably the most clear verse, this 1 John 4, 17 verse of Scripture in all of the Bible to that point that we are united with Christ, that there is no separation. And I'll go you one better, that there's no distinction. Let's let that sit for a minute. No distinction, no distinguishing us from Christ after our new birth or our rebirth. No distinguishing us Christ in union with us by the Father, by the angels, and you better believe it, not by Satan himself. His only influence in our lives is in our own lack of knowledge by which we are destroyed. Hosea 4, 6 tells us that. You notice it says, my people. He wasn't talking about the world. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Hallelujah. He knows, Satan does, what the majority of believers don't know, that we are one with Christ. And Christ is one with us. I'm not him and he's not me, but we are a package deal. We're like scrambled eggs, Jesus and I. You can't unscramble us. Once you're scrambled together, you become a whole new thing. 
and it can't be undone. We're going to talk about that. As I said, he knows the majority of believers don't know that we are one with Christ and Christ one with us. Oh, but the moment you enter into that revelation, his time in attempting to deceive and influence you comes to an end, comes to a sudden halt because he can't fool you anymore. Because you can rise up in the one that you're in and remind him that he's already defeated and that you're more than a conqueror. What if the church really believed that we were more than a conqueror? Where would deliverance ministry go if we already thought we were more than conquerors? Believers. You see, Jesus suffered the penalty of our sin as us, as Tim said. He became us in that moment upon the cross as surely as he became sin. Now I'm going to go into what I called creation's accounting for oneness. To the contrary, we have what I'll call this creation's accounting, where we suffered the penalty of Adam's sin as Adam. Did you ever think it was unfair that you were born into sin? I didn't do nothing. Man, my parents get together. I'm born again, and I'm a slave. Or I'm born for the first time, not born again. My initial birth, I'm a slave? What's up with that? Because we were treated post-cross as in the first Adam. And after, as if we were in the second Adam. And that's where you all are today, in second Adam. We were born into Adam. That's how it works in the spirit. Because we were born into Adam, there was no separation. And there was no distinction. No distinction of us from Adam after our initial birth. You know, there are only two races of man that exist in the earth today. Those that are in Adam and those that are in Christ. Don't let the world fool you. There's only two races. And Jesus came to redeem what had been sold. Christ came to redeem us, to purchase us back, because Adam had sold us out. Mankind, he sold us all out. You know, we didn't have to believe in Adam, the first Adam, to be into him. But you do have to believe in the second one to be in him. We died to first Adam when Christ died as us, taking into himself everything that we were. We were resurrected into second Adam, Christ Jesus, when we arose as him. Don't lose me now. Now united with him, having taken into ourselves everything that he is, which he's freely given to all that believe in him. You know, we know these things inside, and I know they resonate with your spirit, but how often are we thinking about this stuff? How often do we go over this? This is identity. This is the basis and foundation of identity. Here's a bonus thought. And just as we could not, through any acts of righteousness, undo what Adam had done in selling mankind out, now in Christ, we cannot, through any acts of unrighteousness, undo what Jesus has accomplished in redeeming mankind back to the Father. The only stipulation, the only work, if you want to call it that, is that you believe on Christ. That's it. John 6, 27, it says, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, Because God the Father has set his seal upon him. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. So now that we're born again and in Christ, what do works look like? The answer is simple. They look exactly like the works that the Father accomplished through Jesus. Just now in us into and through us throughout the course of our life here because we have now been united with him. In John 14, it says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father which dwells in me 
does the works. We are one in Christ. In John 14, 19, it says, A little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments or my word and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. Jesus has been manifested to you in a real, tangible, spiritual way. Of course, we're renewing our mind to that, right? That's our job as disciples of Christ. That's why I love this crowd, because this is my discipleship family. These are the ones that, you know, Sunday's not enough. A lot of these same people are in small groups, and not just one, but many, because you're pursuing the truth is your spirit is driving you to do it. This oneness sheds some light on a scripture that you may not have considered before and one that puzzles many. And that's in John 14 and 12 where he says, Most assuredly I say to you that he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do. Now I circled that. The works that I do, he will do. Because when we're doing the work, We're doing the work that he has us doing, just like the works that he did the Father had him doing. It's a unity thing. It's not a us apart from him or separated from him or him up there and us down here waiting for his return. He's already returned. He returned the moment he was resurrected. He returned again the moment Eddie was reborn. He returned in numbers again the moment Cynthia was reborn and in numbers again when the Holloman family were reborn. And I mean in numbers. <laughs> and all of you, you know, I used to think, I used to wonder, what is my number? I used to be of that mindset. What is my number? What was my? He was the firstborn. You know, there only is one firstborn because we're in that firstborn. There wasn't a secondborn. If we're talking about strict interpretation and unity, we are in the firstborn. So therefore, we are the firstborn. There is no more just you. There is no more just me. There is only us. In John 10 and 30, I and my father are one. In Philippians 2 and 5 through 7, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and it took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He was in the likeness of men, but still identifying with the Father as I am. What say you? The second part, right? The first part is, what do you say he is? What are you saying about yourself? In Psalms 82, it says, I said ye are gods, and all of you children of the Most High. And in 2 Peter, I don't have it written down here, but I think it's 1 and 4, he says you are partakers of his divine nature. As I like to say, capital C, children of God. Because I don't want to make that distinction, distinction either. If Father doesn't do it, why would I want to do that? I'm of the family. I'm family. Praise God. Zechariah 12 and 8, it says, In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. So some closing thoughts. Number one is one who never speaks of his identity never speaks to his identity. Let me say that again. 
One who never speaks of his identity never speaks to his identity. In Mark 8, 27 and 29, it says, He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Going back full circle to the beginning. Have you truly considered what God has said about you? We're wrapping up, I promise. It's so quiet. I hope it's because this is sinking in. Not because you're hoping I get done. <laughs> in Philemon's 1.6, in the Amplified, it says, And I pray that the participation in and sharing of your faith may produce and promote full recognition and appreciation and understanding and precise knowledge of every good thing that is ours in our identification with, it says, Christ Jesus and unto his glory. Again, that's the Amplified. So my second point, which has a lot to do with the prophecies over this church and, and you know, with Bible and Biscuits, we're talking about saying yes to God. And we've been talking about dreams and the fulfillment of dreams and the resurrection of dreams within us that God has placed in you from the time that you can remember. I want to say this. He who never speaks of his dreams never speaks to his dreams about his identity. One who never speaks of his dreams, never speaks to his dreams about his identity. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 17, but the person who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. And in the Young's Literal, which I love that translation, it's kind of rough on the English, but this one's pretty simple. It says, and he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. No distinction, no separation. You know, you don't have a spirit apart from Christ. Many in the church don't get that. They think it's an us and him thing, and it's not. It's a we thing. I love when uh, Shane was here not too long ago, and he was talking about we is risen, not he is risen. It's so good. I love that. I want to close with, uh, it's actually a just, you know, a lot of times when I'm in worship on Sundays, the Lord speaks to me or on Wednesdays, and, and I get this strong impression in words, and, and I'm just going to throw a couple of those out because he's been talking to me about this identity in him and with him for a long time. And, and what he said was, you have not simply believed in me. You have believed into me. There's one seat in heaven for you, and it's my throne. And you are already seated there in me. The veil being torn eliminated all separation, removed all spiritual distinction, and revealed all of love's intention and identification. Yeah, he does speak to me that way. As you rise up in these arising truths, because they're in you, my praise and my praises rise back to me and flow like a mighty rushing river throughout all of the earth. And then last week he said to me, I was in Bible and Biscuits listening to Brad actually when he said this to me. And he said, what if the return of Christ that we're all waiting for is not what we thought? What if he returned and continues to return in every born again believer? We're just not mindful of it. I mean, he is going to come back someday physically. But he's already here. We're not waiting on him. He's with us. We're united to him. So with that, you know, I started with the verse of saying to Peter, who do you say that I am? And I'm going to turn that around on you. What say you? Who do you say that I am? The Christ in me. That I am.